I'm Fred Barnes. And I'm Mort Kondrak. Hey, guys. Wait, 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 wait. With all due respect, we are the original Beltway Boys. I still find it odd the control room just thinks everyone thought of it. (laughs) Happy National Hot Mold Cider Day, sports fans. In our lineup tonight, Trump strikes a pose. The fundraising deadlines close, and we turn the tables on our friend, Charlie Rose. But first, House Republicans say, oh, shoot. The House Republican leadership elections are now set for next Thursday. And on day three of Kevin McCarthy's role as Speaker of the House presumptive, he made a whopper of a gaffe. And where did he make this faux pas of epic proportions? Was he in the lion's den of Rachel Maddow? No, he was not. He was in the plush kitten's bed of Sean Hannity. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee, a select committee. What are her numbers today? Her numbers are dropping. Why? Because she's untrustable. But no one would have known any of that had happened had we not I agree. thought and That's made something that good. I give you so credit for that. <laughs> I bet Hillary Clinton was just loving that. So let's check in on her and see what she had to say. I have to tell you, I find them deeply distressing. So when I hear a statement like that, which demonstrates unequivocally that this was always meant to be a partisan political exercise, I feel like it does a grave disservice and dishonors not just the memory of the four that we lost but of everybody who has served our country mark uh, putting aside the sheer rank almost incalculable stupidity of this comment of kevin mccarthy's i ask you in terms of politics on a scale of one to godzilla how good is this for hillary clinton and how bad is it for the following kevin mccarthy trey gowdy and the republican party horrible for every republican you listed <laughs> look it's bad for mccarthy because we you and i both talk about how boehner's un- underappreciated That's underestimated true. being speaker of the house everything you say gets scrutiny mccarthy has never been on this stage totally. he's one of the least experienced speakers ever assuming he becomes speaker after yes this. after this and and uh for gowdy Gowdy had spent months carefully preparing the hearings, trying to do what no Republican has done in a long time, run in a politically effective, right. substantive hearing, yeah. former prosecutor. Yeah. Almost nothing he can do now yeah. will not be attacked by Democrats who will just say this, this hearing is all political. And let me say, you know, you have said for a while that you thought that Gowdy could might pull that off. <laughs> now Gowdy's had it taken out of his hands by McCarthy. A long shadow now cast across this. Hillary Clinton is going to say the things she said on TV today over and over over and over again, I thought there was almost nothing that could break the momentum of this email story, the main, the, at least until she got to the hearings. Now, she's on offense, they're on defense. Uh, this is a disaster, a disaster for congressional Republicans and, and, and for Republican presidential candidates who want to see Hillary Clinton on her heels. And you look, we talk, you talk about how McCarthy was not in a hostile place. He was on Fox, but he was facing the question of what have they accomplished? And the other thing that Democrats are going to turn to is not just saying the par- hearings are partisan yep. and political, but saying this is what they think their accomplishment is. Yes, exactly political right. hearings. Exactly right. Huge, huge problem for the Republicans. All right. Today is the day when all those presidential campaign email solicitations for money, money, money come to an end, at least for a few days. The three-month fundraising period closes tonight at midnight, and every campaign wants to take in as much as possible, both because they need the cash to pay for TV ads, etc., but also they want bragging rights. John, are the numbers that are going to come out over the next few days and weeks to get to the reporting disclosure? Are they more important because of the actual money or because of the symbolism? I'm going to give you a mushy mouth answer here because I think it really depends on the candidate and the, and the numbers, right? Um, Jeb Bush, in some sense, is very well capitalized. But if his number is much lower than expected, that will be symbolically really bad for him. Um, there are a bunch of other establishment camp- candidates who need the money, but they also need the symbolism of being the non-Bush, non-Trump uh, candidate who does surprisingly well in this period. You can win this battle either in terms of expectations and symbolism and, of course, you can also win it in terms of dollars and cents. Um, it really depends on the circumstances. They all need both. Kasich needs the money yeah. and the symbolism. Rubio needs the I'll money. I'll tell you, the symbolism that Hillary Clinton, she better hope she has the number of donors close to Sanders, because Sanders have an extraordinary number. The person who's going to have A the... A million, I believe, they're the saying. Person Sanders, who, yeah. Contributors, the per, contributions. The person I think is going to have the best quarter in some ways is Ben Carson, because he's going to have a big net number 
but he's also going to have the symbolism of lots of small con contributors online, which have increased and or kept up pace at least right. since he made his controversial co comments about a Muslim not being president. Right. And there's no doubt. Look on the establishment side, people like Rubio need both the symbolism and the money. Sism symbolism to me is more important. Okay. Today, uh, Donald Trump hit the media honeypot, the mother load. El Dorado, um, he had some great numbers, but this is not the mother load I'm talking about. He had some great numbers in the USA Today Suffolk University poll that shows him strengthening his lead in the GOP primary race, leading every other candidate by double, visit, by double digits. Um, he also had a, an interview last night on Bill O'Reilly. Always a big moment for Donald Trump. But the thing that really mattered for Donald Trump is the fact that he ended up being on the cover of People magazine. Um, a seven-page spread, interview with the Trump family, a surefire way to make any presidential candidate look fun, relaxed, all-American, and good-looking. So, Mark, I want to know what you think as we <laughs> gaze here upon the People magazine spread. What does it say about Donald Trump's place in the Republican race in American life? Trump's press secretary should quit her job today. She should drop the mic and walk out. <laughs> this is an incredible, hundreds of millions of dollars. That's an exaggeration, but we're talking about Trump. This is worth millions of bucks. Any presidential campaign, the, the text is all positive. The pictures are glowing, the family and, and just the whole thing. It's incredible. It's spectacular. It's worthy of Mr. Trump and his view <laughs> of how he should be covered. You know, everybody wants to spread like this in People Magazine if you're running for president. Here's the guy most well known, can get earned media whenever he wants, and he gets a seven page gift from Time Warner that he's going to be happy about. And as I said, anybody running for president would kill for that kind of coverage. You know, there's, there's nothing, and I, I say this and not in, with no tone of criticism around it, um, there's nothing normal about Donald Trump. There's nothing, nothing about the way he lives, nothing about his family, nothing about his history, nothing that's normal. He's outsized, uh, whether you like him or hate him, he's outsized in every regard. You don't get on the cover of People magazine by being normal. But there is, in a weird way, because of the all-Americana kind of quality of people, there's a way in which this normalizes Trump in the, in the way that celebrities can be normalized, yeah. which is a weird way to be normalized. But this makes him look like every other American celebrity, every other big-time big, big -time politician who would end up on People magazine. There's a homogenizing effect, and I think that's good for him to be homogenized in the, that way. The, the other thing is he's getting contextualized by the love of his family. Yes. You know, they appeared at the announcement. He was introduced by Ivanka, his wife. And his, and his kids were there, they've not been very visible. Right. Uh, they've not done a lot of interviews. They've not been around. Ivanka was at the debate, but she, she didn't speak publicly, although I talked to her a little bit afterwards. This cover, the photos, the text, as you said, it not only normalizes them, but it humanizes them. Right. And there are lots of people who read People magazine who are maybe not currently thinking of voting, who I think will be engaged here. And at home with the Trump's exclamation point, headline for the ages. I bet there are a lot of people who don't even know Donald Trump has a son that age, exactly. but certainly not one with hair that looks so much like... As he says in the article, the Trump come over. All right, coming up, we turn the tables on the man with the most famous table in television, Chella Rose, and the original Beltway Boys, after this word from our sponsors. the buzz, Mort. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> because the, the rest of the world is not paying attention, Fred, but it was 10 years ago this very day that television history was made. The big boys were launched upon the scene. You know, I hope people understand. You think they recognize that this is not an adversarial show. We've done those before, but a buddy show. True. And that's the concept. True. True. That we like each other. We disagree about half the time. You know, when, when you hear Obama talking about people coming together and they disagree, but they come together, we're the people that he's been talking about. It's the Bellway Boys. Exactly. Your, your initials are F and B, but I'm the fair and balanced one. Uh, the year was 2008, and history was definitively made there. Our guest tonight is two guests tonight, Morton Kondracki and Fred Barnes. They've been known over the years amongst as other things as the Beltway Boys, which by D.C. standards is a pretty nice gang. They're also the authors of a new book, Jack Kemp, the Bleeding Heart Conservative, who changed America. Simplest question I could possibly ask, Mort, how did he change America? He was the original political uh, uh, exponent of supply-side economics. Now, you have to remember what the 1970s were like. Malaise, 
long gas lines, high unemployment, high inflation, uh, and nobody knew what to do about it. Jack Kemp in, uh, didn't invent supply-side economics, but he advanced it. He got the Republican Party, that is to say, cutting marginal tax rates, individual tax rates. The tax, top tax rate was 70 percent uh, in, in, in before 1981. So he convinces the party. Then he convinces Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan picks up on supply-side economics, puts through the first tax cuts, 50 to 70 percent, and comparable rate reductions for other, other people. And it set off a boom that lasted 25 years. And the boom made it possible for, uh, for us to have a big defense budget, which helped topple the Soviet Union. And at the end of the, the, the Reagan era, uh, democratic capitalism was deemed to be the quote unquote end of history, right? And Jack Kemp deserves a lot so of credit we, we for that. We should say he was an NFL quarterback. He was a congressman from Buffalo, New York. Right. Eventually gets on the ticket, but how did he exercise so much influence as a congressman? Well, he uh, was self-taught in economics, uh, and it turned out he had a better formula, a better answer than all the Keynesians and all the liberal economists who back in the 70s threw up their hands, as Mort said. Uh, they didn't know what to do, uh, and he had a plan. Uh, and it was to cut the, uh, the rates, uh, particularly on, on the wealthy, because they're the people that can invest to some extent. It was trickle-down economics, but the key thing was it worked so well. Uh, and. You know, it became uh, known as Reaganomics, but Kemp put together a movement. It was really outside of Congress. I mean, he, he didn't, uh, he, he was more of a presidential figure, even when he was a backbench House member. I see Ted Cruz now. He's trying to be uh, a, a guy to do something in the Senate, but all he does is yell at the leadership and say they're lying and so on. Kemp never did that. He never criticized the leaders. He just went around them. When I think about Jack Kemp, I think about two, two things. They're temperamental. One is inclusive and the other is optimistic. Um, as much as the intellectual contributions, um, he was a bleeding heart conservative, so self-styled before George W. Bush, long before he was a compassionate conservative. He was the real compassionate conservative. Right. Jo George W. Bush sort of forgot about it after he was around a while. Right, so what do you think, I mean, Kemp talked about uh, 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 lifting up minorities, talked about wrapping his arms around the working class of all different ethnicities. Um, sure. What would Jack Kemp say about the Republican Party of today? Oh, he would be deeply happy with the Republican Party of today that's that I mean that that is confining itself to southern old white people basically uh, and, and he wanted he wanted the Republican Party to once again become the party of Abraham Lincoln in two senses uh, the Lincoln the emancipator by reaching out and having you know civil rights and he thought that that uh, that blacks would join the Republican Party this was fanciful if not romantic uh, would re, would re uh, would reaffiliate with the Republican Republican Party if they produced growth and gave jobs uh, to, uh, to blacks and, and other minorities. Uh, so th that was half of it. But the other half of the, of the Lincoln uh, uh, playbook was that everybody should rise, that right. the, the idea of America is that everybody has an opportunity to rise regardless of who they are. And basically it was for working people. And, uh, can't believe that as well. You guys have, Fred, you guys have a historically large field in the Republican Party right now. Yep. Um, 16 candidates. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody in that field when you look, or any buddies in that field when you look where you see a, a glimmer of Jack Kemp? Well, I think you see a, a little of it in, uh, in, in Jeb Bush. Well, actually, a lot of it in Jeb Bush, not the dynamism. I mean, Kemp was a really di a dynamic figure. And you see it in, uh, in, in the tax cuts of Jeb Bush and Donald Trump. You know, they're, they're reducing the rates uh, and, you know, reducing the rate to 25 percent in the Trump bill, uh, the rate on individual income, and 28 percent in the Bush bill. Kemp would have liked that. What he really would have hated uh, was what Republicans are saying on immigration. Right. You know, it's turned in the last few years that they've become the anti-immigrant party in the last few years. That's why I agree with Mort that it's the candidates who are good up in our terms uh, on immigration. Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, John Kasich are the only ones who can win. Well, you need to get 40 percent of the Hispanic vote. The book, again, is Jack Kemp, the Bleeding Heart Conservative Who Changed America. A great book, already well received, available at your finer bookshops now. And you can read about a guy who was one of the most influential figures in America and never got elected president. Mort, Fred, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back.
late breaking news. The U.S. House of Representatives just passed a bill that will keep the government open through December 11th. That averts the shutdown for now, but kicks the can down the road. Lots of big decisions left in Washington with the new Republican leadership. We'll be right back. Joining us now is a man who, by any other name, would interview newsmakers just as sweet. Charlie Rose, thank you for making the walk from your studio literally right next door. Oh, my gosh. To, it took me at least 30 seconds. It took you at least 30 seconds. For those of you, for those of you who don't know, uh, which is pretty much only people living in a cave of ignorance, <laughs> deep dark somewhere at the center of the earth, uh, yeah. Charlie recently interviewed Vladimir Putin before the U.N. summit and British Prime Minister David Cameron on the set of CBS This Morning. Here is how those interviews went. So you would like to join the United States in the fight against ISIS. That's part of why you're there. Others think that while that may be part of your goal, you're to trying to save the Assad administration because they've been losing uh, ground and the war has not been going well for them. And you're there to rescue them. Well, you're right. So yeah, that's same, the question. Same Are you purpose. prepared to work with Russia and Iran in the battle against ISIS in Syria? I will work with anybody in order to build a Syria that's free of Assad and free of uh, ISIL. So, Charlie, um, yeah. uh, let's start with uh, Putin, right? Let's start with how happy I'm to be here. Uh, okay. Well, let's, at, let's... at this table. At this table. At, at this, this table. table. Yeah. Um, th there's not that many journalists who've got to sit across from Putin in the way that you did. And, and, and not any broadcast journalist from the West that I know of right. in seven or eight years. I at, may be wrong about and, that, but I haven't seen it. And an extraordinary length. Right? Yeah. Well, he um, talked you know, for an hour and 40 minutes, and then he invited me to come in uh, and have a cup of tea. And a cup of tea went into appetizers, appetizers went into dinner, and, you know. <laughs> Next thing you knew, two hours later, I was we were both saying drunk. goodbye. Both <laughs> no, there was no, drunk. there was no vodka, which was a great sadness a, to me. I bet it was. <laughs> Nor so, caviar either, by the way. Man, this whole trip is a blown trip. <laughs> Let me ask you this question, though, the simplest possible yeah. thing. Yes. You looked into his eyes, like George W. Bush, who said he saw his soul, right? Um, what, what, what's he like? What's he like? Which, what's this guy like? He is a man who is the leader of a country that he loves. He calls it the fatherland. He was terribly um, affected by uh, the collapse of the Soviet empire. He said as much. He said it was a great disaster of the 20th century. He is not out to restore the Soviet empire. He's out, in my judgment, of what he says to me, to try to make sure that Russia is heard and respected, uh, and that it plays a role. I think in Syria, he has lots of objectives there. One, Russian interest. Two, I think he believes that he wants to get in the battle against ISIS. He believes it's necessary to join with whatever only state there to do that. Uh, the United States and others share that in terms, in the short term, they want to transition Assad out. But I think that's what he's about. He's about Russia. Uh, You're an observant man. Just talk about leaving aside what he said in the interview, which was obviously gripping. What's he like? What's his humanity like? What was he like as a host? What are his sort of, you know, human traits like? Well, first of all, um, I had met him once before uh, in June mm -hmm. in St. Petersburg. Right. And so as soon as that was over, because it was a large conference and a gathering and, and I had to talk you know, in, in the midst of a lot of people, and it wasn't what I wanted, which was a one-on-one interview. So I continued to stay in communication and asked you guys text see back him. and forth? Not, no, not him. <laughs> no, no. I, I, um, but people around him yeah. text back and forth. Uh -huh. And I made clear that I would love to do something. And, and they finally said yes. And they said, we'll do it when we get to the UN. Only you. We're not doing anything else. And then they said, uh, change your plans. You have to come to Moscow. And I said, I'll do it. You know, and it, it worked out because we were going to do it for my program, for CBS this morning, especially for 60 Minutes. Right. The but two it, things they were most interested in was 60 Minutes because of the wide exposure and my program right. because we were going to run the whole damn thing. But, but is, is he warm? Is he gracious? Yes. Did he tell jokes? He smiled, and yes. I mean, he was <laughs> amused. Yes. I mean, it, 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 look, compared to other heads is of he, state. Is he likable? Uh, in terms of the context when I saw him, yeah. yes. You know, in terms of what he does, uh, which I don't necessarily know all the details of, no. You know, I mean, they, they, I've said to him, 
They think you can be more authoritative than you've ever been. They think that they point to a climate in this country in which people, uh, political opponents, are killed, which journalists are imprisoned and killed. Right. Uh, and they talk about corruption and power corrupting. So I was talking to, uh, to one of your uh, uh, executive producers on one of your many shows. Yes. Um, <laughs> who talked to me about how much preparation you do how amazing it is to watch you when there's a big high stakes interview like this and how much you did for this one. Right. Just, just open up that process a little bit. What do you do to get ready when you're going to be doing an interview like this that you know the whole world's going to be watching? Well, first of all, I have to do it myself. I can't have somebody else do it for me, even though I had a remarkable group of people uh, on my show and, and on my 60 Minutes show as yeah. well. And, and Jeff Fager went over there. It is essential for me to have it in my head. And then for me to decide on what the arc of the conversation, where I'm going to begin, how I'm going to shift. Now, it may change, because one of the funny things that happened is they said, Mate, we really want to talk right. about the, of what he's going to say at the UN. Right. So rather than asking the first question, which I assume would be, why are you in Syria? Right. I changed it to say, what are you going to say to the UN? Because right. <laughs> they had said, he'd be inter he's interested in talking about what he's going to say at the UN. The first thing he said to me, 60 Minutes goes on on Sunday night. I'm going to make a speech on Monday. I'm not going to tell you on 60 Minutes what I'm going to say on Monday. I said, but, you know. That's why I'm here. That's why right. I'm here. Politics. Yes. What interests you about the U.S. presidential election right now? Oh, two things that really interest me. The, the idea of how strong Hillary Clinton is or is not uh, to what's going to happen with respect to that. I think on the Republican side, you know, I'm fascinated by you know, whether Donald Trump has, has peaked and what factors have led to that. Uh, I mean, clearly Donald Trump was on the same program on 60 Minutes, interviewed very well by my colleague Scott Pelley. You know, and the ratings for that, my interview and Scott's with Trump. Mostly for yours. Mostly for Scott's, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the same time, you know, it was a great premiere for 60 Minutes. But I mean, there's still this interest. But I, my sense is, the message is not as fresh as it has been. Right. Now, he can probably change that by introducing, as he did with tax reform, and that creates a whole nother debate. But where, has he peaked or not? I don't know. One of the, uh, thing, one of the things that, 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 that is uh, true of all your interests is that you are interested in people in all walks of life who are at the top of their game. Right. People who are excellent at whatever And they wanting do. to know how they got there and how they exploit you know. and, and what the commonalities are. Exactly. Is there anybody right now in, on the Republican side or the Democratic side who you really think is right now at the top of their game? Sure. I mean, I think, I think Rubio is, is at, at, at a good place. On the other hand, he has some policy positions that I don't think have been fully explored uh, that might prove troubling for uh, a general constituency. Yeah. You're ready Trump. to get rid of me, aren't you? Well, only because the program's about to end, oh. and unlike your program that lasts an hour, <laughs> this one is only 30 minutes. Yes. And, also, and also isn't live. What a great program. day for me. I get, I, you know, I get to go to Russia and interview Putin. I get to walk across Charlie, the hall and be on you. with all your We're going to get you back here really soon. Never change. Check us out on BloombergPolitics.com. Until tomorrow, Charlie, please join us in saying right there to the camera, sayonara. Sayonara. <laughs> <laughs>